Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this, the 84th George Ernest Morrison Lecture um, from the Australian National University. My name is Benjamin Penny. I'm the host of this lecture tonight. And just before I, I pass the camera over to our Vice Chancellor, Professor Brian Schmidt, I would just like to note that um, there will be a question and answer period. If you could lodge, write any questions in the, in the relevant panel on your Zoom screen, I will ask them of our guest speaker tonight at the end of his talk. The second thing I'd like to say before I hand over to our Vice Chancellor is to note that this is one of perhaps the last few occasions he will be hosting as Vice Chancellor. It's only a matter of weeks before he finishes up an eight year term. And on behalf of, I don't know, the faculty, those of us who do Chinese studies in this university, just pass on our thanks for his, um, his leadership over the last eight years, his inspiration and his service to the university. With that, I'd like to hand over now to our Vice Chancellor, Professor Brian Schmidt. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Penny, Ben, uh, as I will normally refer to you, and welcome everyone. Uh, I'd like to begin, as we do here in Canberra, by acknowledging the first Australians on whose traditional lands I'm speaking from. This is the traditional home of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and I pay my respects to elders past and present. It is a privilege to welcome everyone tonight to the 84th installment of one of the world's oldest continuous public lecture series on China. The George E. Morrison lecture, lecture was founded in 1932 and was initially supported by prominent figures of the Chinese community in Australia, including William Marquette and William J. Liu. The lectures commemorated the life and work of George Ernest Morrison, a journalist from Geelong and Victoria, who went on to live and travel in Qing, China, before eventually being appointed as political advisor to the newly established Republic of China. The aim of the lecture was to strengthen cultural relations and mutual understanding between Australia and China, particularly during the socially fraught years of the white Australia policy. Now, the Morrison Lecture Series was originally hosted by the Institute of Anatomy in Canberra and lapsed during the Second World War. It was revived in 1948 by Sir Douglas Copeland, the first vice chancellor of the newly created Australian National University, who, of course, was the ambassador to China at that time. For the past 75 years, the ANU community has welcomed a long list of Morrison lecturers, each of them speakers of the highest distinction. It has also been exciting for us to take the event to an international audience by moving the series online in recent years. Not only does it make the lecture more accessible, it allows for us all to take part in genuinely global exchanges with and about China. It is fitting that the lecture is happening just days after Prime Minister Anthony Albanese's meeting with President Xi Jinping. In a time of heightened international tension, strengthening relations between Australia and China and promoting a deeper understanding of the PRC has never been more important. It is now my pleasure to officially introduce the 84th Morrison Lecture, Professor Yuri Pines. Yuri Pines is the Michael W. Lipson Professor of Asian Studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. His research focuses on early Chinese political thought, traditional Chinese political culture, early Chinese historiography, and the history of pre-imperial China and comparative studies of imperial formations worldwide. His monographs include the Book of Lord Shang, um, Apo Apologetics of the State Power in Early China, and the Everlasting Empire, the Political Culture of Ancient China and its Imperial Legacy. He has ed edited a number of books, including the upcoming Tao Companion to Chinese Fa Tradition, and has published over 150 articles and book chapters. It is an honor to have you with us, Yuri. It's great that you've been able to join us. And thank you so much for your time, everyone, and enjoy tonight's lecture. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Schmidt. And I'm very much honored to participate in such distinguished event and uh, to be invited 
uh, from Beijing. I am joining you from Beijing. And uh, without much ado, I think that uh, we shall start. Just I hope that uh, you can see my my shared screen. We can see it. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Excellent. So uh, you know, uh, it's very. It is the topic which I have uh, opted to discuss today. It is not a good topic to start to attract the mass audience, especially from outside China, to Chinese political philosophy or to Chinese to Chinese political culture, because normally I should I should have selected something nicer or something more pleasant, for instance, discussing the idea of harmony in early China or the idea of a quest for peace or whatever, whatever, whatever. And there are a lot of great ideas in China which could have been discussed today. But I have opted for something a little bit different and a little bit provocative, the idea of anti-intellectual uh, ideology in early China, ideology which is mostly associated with two, two guys to my left and to my right, to, to, to the right and to the uh, left of the larger picture, Shang Yang and Han Fei, who are usually known in the West by the name legalists. I don't like the term legalists. I use the term far tradition, but whatever. Now, uh, I have selected this topic partly inspired by one of the greatest scholars of uh, traditional Chinese political thought and culture, Professor Yu Yingxi, the late Professor Yu Yingxi, who just passed away a few years ago. Uh, early in his career, he penned this famous article about the anti-intellectualism in China's political tradition. Uh, the, Professor Yu was writing during the high day of anti-Confucian campaign, the very bizarre campaign in uh, mainland China, and uh, during the period of authoritarian rule in the Republic of China on Taiwan. So, he was very pessimistic about Chinese political culture, about Chinese political tradition, and he felt that however nice the beginning were during Confucius' daytime, lifetime, later with the imperial unification, China became anti-intellectual. I don't think that I accept many of his ideas. I am sure that he himself would have reconsidered many of, he, of these ideas should he have republished this article after 20 or 30 years, but he had one very major, very important observation. There is indeed, in Chinese political culture, in Chinese political thought, there is an idea that intellectuals are problematic, that they are useless, that they are needless, and actually that they are subversive. And this idea was not promulgated by the state. We are all, we are all accustomed and we are all somehow accept, yes, bad politicians, bad political leaders suppress us intellectuals. We know this, this happens. But the idea is that in China, it started during the high day of intellectual freedom without any oppressive political apparatus uh, in place. It started by the intellectuals against the intellectuals. And this is the topic which I want to discuss. Why? Some of the intellectuals turn against the other, against their class, not against the other, against the entire intellectual stratum. Why they betray their class? What is the logic? What is the rationale? And what is the price they had to pay for this class betrayal? Now, I, I don't know who are in the audience, but I, am, I assume that some people are uh, very well know, acquainted with Chinese political tradition and some people are less. So. Most people know that the age of the warring states period, the fifth to third century BCE, the high day of Chinese intellectual flowering, the so-called cold age of the hundred schools of thought. And there were many ideas, many ideological debates, which is very true. But I want to remind, to remind the audience that beyond these debates, there were some ideas which all different political currents hold in common. And these are, in my eyes, the five major ideas of consensus, which actually define what is Chinese political culture, because there are a lot of disagreements about details. But these five fundamental topics 
are agreed upon by Confucians, by so-called legalists, or what I call from now on the far tradition, by people who are sometimes labeled as Taoists, etc., etc., etc. And these ideas are, first, stability is in unity, the all under heaven, which today refers to China, must be unified. Second, when we speak about unity, there is not just unity under uh, pluralistic government, there must be one single unifier. This is a principle of monarchism. My late uh, mentor, Professor Liu Zehua, his most famous term, which coined by him was the Wang Chuan, the principle of, monar of monarchic rule, which he saw, uh, he saw as essential to Chinese political culture, and I agree very much. Uh, three, everybody knows that, you know, the ruler, uh, he's not necessarily the brightest, and he's not necessarily the cleverest and the most adequate person. So you need to maintain a country, you need very good bureaucracy, which should be staffed by professionals. This is a principle of meritocracy. Not the degree will, de will, de will define your position, but your abilities, your merits. And the ideal is that any person of abilities will aspire to serve in the government. Not everybody will get into the government, but at least everybody will try. This was not very much, uh, this, this was not consensus. There were some debates about it, but most of the political thinkers agreed that a man, man of service or intellectual, which we shall discuss immediately, this, this term, must serve in the government. And finally, the people, they deserve at most concern, they deserve all the economic concerned by the states, but they are not supposed to be participants in policy making, which I call the benevolent paternalism in Chinese. It is usually termed the min ben si siang, the people as the root of the government. Okay. These were the points of agreement. And everybody wanted to, to create, and which actually eventually was created, a powerful, monarchic, meritocratic political system, the Chinese empire. We are speaking now about the centuries before the Chinese empire was created. However, these ideas, or at least points two to four, were very much undermined by the haughty discourse of the very intellectuals who were the promulgators of these ideas. And now we are going to these intellectuals and try to understand why they were so self-confident. Now, uh, the age of the warring states was the golden age of Chinese intellectuals. Look, uh, I use the term intellectuals also borrowing it from Yu Ying Shi. Uh, the term in Chinese is Shi. Shi are not necessarily, not all are, of Shi are intellectuals, but, but all intellectuals belong to this stratum, Shi, men of service, whatever you define it. Shi? The rise of the Xi is the single most important development in China before the imperial unification. In the 6th century BCE, there was a marginal stratum at the bottom of the hereditary aristocracy. By the 4th century BCE, this was the new ruling elite. The idea of meritocracy allowed these people to move up despite having no observable pedigree. And it was amazing because, you know, there was a really bloodless revolution. They seized power from the hereditary aristocrats without all the bloodshed which accompanied social revolutions elsewhere. It is a very interesting topic not to be discussed today. Now, it is not enough that they became the power holders in each of the major political entities, each of the major states which comprised the Chinese world back then. They were also the intellectual leaders, the unrivaled intellectual leaders. And this is also very interesting. You know, in the 6th century BCE, for instance, we know from the text from that period, the Zodran, for in, uh, the major text, that ideologically important pronouncements are made by courtiers, not necessarily by the rulers, but at least by high ministers. In the 4th century BCE, courts lose entirely their prestige in intellectual life. Everything is defined by the masters, the masters, the leaders, the intellectual leaders of the Shi, the philosophers, 
who are moving from one court to another, who propose their ideas, who are hired and very lavishly treated by the imperial leaders, but not the imperial, the political leaders of that age. And these guys are those who define what is right and what is wrong. Again, it is amazing that how they establish this monopoly on the on the way, on what is the way, what is the Tao, the major, the guiding principles of political and social life. I simply don't understand why nobody said, no, sorry, who are you guys? Why are you saying to telling to us what to do? It happens sometimes that intellectuals are really very much prized and we are at the age that they were very much prized. And what also uh, gave them much confidence is that they had the freedom of employment. Very much like us, you know, if I am not satisfied at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and I have some quarrel with my president, which is potentially now may happen, if I don't like my president, uh, okay, I shall go. I shall go and move to, to Beijing University or to uh, Fudan University or to Heidelberg or to uh, Princeton or the worst of the worst to Tel Aviv University, the major rival of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Now, that is why the president will try not to alienate me very much, even if I am provocative, even if my political views are not exactly what he would like to see, he would try to be polite. And this was exactly the case of all these great intellectuals of the warring states period who were saying very blatant things to the rulers, were very critical minded, were very daring to say to the rulers, you are nothing, I am much cleverer than you. And the rulers had to accept it because, you know, you can punish one intellectual, but then you will have a brain drain. Everybody will go to the court of another of your rival and then you will be very weak and nobody wanted to become weak. So this peculiar situation, you combine A, political power, B, intellectual authority, C, the freedom of movement, which empowers you vis-a-vis -vis the, ru the rulers, all this creates a very peculiar situation of haughty, proshy discourse, which permits the texts of the Warwick States period. And against this discourse, my heroes, the far thinkers will uh, come in. But before we go into the far thinkers, let me explain you what I mean by the Haughtiness, not just self-confidence, but just haughtiness. Look, Mengze, you know, everybody likes Mengze, I'm sure that everybody who studied a little bit about China knows this name, Mencius or Mengze, so proud of himself. And he says, ah, there are three matters that command respect under heaven. First is rank, second is age, third is virtue. At court, rank is supreme. Uh, in the village community age, but in supporting the generation and prolonging the people's life, nothing is comparable to virtue. So nice. Now, come on. Therefore, the ruler who has great plans must have a ministers who cannot be summoned. No, you see, you are the ruler. You want me to serve you. You must be very polite. You must treat me very politely because otherwise, sorry, I don't feel that I am your inferior. There are two parallel pyramids. The one is political, which you are indeed at the head of it. And the second one is moral and intellectual, which I am at the top of it. And it goes to very dangerous implications. Look, for instance, Mengze says about uh, the grandson of Confucius who is uh, meeting the Lord uh, of the state of Lu and uh, the Lord Mu went to Zisi and asked him, in antiquity, how did the rulers of a middle uh, small state manage to befriend Shi? Now, sorry, what is the question? We all would so much be glad that presidents of our countries or prime ministers of our countries or even presidents of our universities will ask us, ah, what should we do in order to befriend professors of humanities? So nice. Now, Zisi did not like that. And Mengze said, Zisi had to answer, judging by position, you are the ruler and I am the minister. How dare I befriend the ruler? 
Now, judging by virtue, the, you serve me. How can you befriend me? And ladies and gentlemen, virtue, we all know it is a very nice term and usually it indeed, it indeed refers to moral virtue and more morally nice behavior, but everybody knew and Mengs knew it perfectly that the same term also refers to charisma, mana, to your power, to your legitimacy, to actually something which makes you fitting to be a ruler. And if you tell the ruler that you need to serve me, serving, you can see it in Chinese, those of you who read Chinese, it adds a if you say the ruler that you need to serve me, it means you are his superior. Theoretically, even politically, you are his superior. This is intolerable. Now, you see, Mengzi, as every thinker, he was committed to the idea of the monarchism, that there must be only one ruler and we all must serve him. But when you say these things, how can you serve the monarch if you so much believe that you are his superior? And look, Mengzi, of course, I will not attack Mengzi. He's the darling of all the intellectuals in China and in may, of many intellectuals worldwide. But look, Mengzi was a nice guy, a very moral guy. There were a lot of people who were less moral and less nice. And they used this discourse of Mengzi and his like to just say, you must respect me and I don't have any obligations to you, you, your majesty. Now, there is one text, for instance, ruler and minister are like friends. They select each other. Nice, we are friends. I don't have any obligations. Again, from the 21st century point of view, many of us would very much like this idea. But believe me, we are in the warring states period. We need the ruler who will decide what is, how to, how to fight the war, whom to fight, when to fight, and you cannot just treat your ministers as your friends. You need to be the leader. You need to decide, to determine. They must obey. And under these circumstances, they will not obey. The Thergs, the, the emperor's minister, is named a minister, but in fact, he's a teacher. The teacher is, of course, as you know, in China, is superior to the student. Not in every country today. The monarch's minister is named minister, but in fact, he is a friend. Now, if you want to succeed, if you want to become a theark or a monarch that to unify all under heaven, treat us well. And this is the less pleasant aspect of this uh, Proshi discourse. We are here in the middle of the bra brazen promotion campaign. Treat us well and everything will be okay. Behave well to us. Everybody will be happy. Mm. Look at this, Liu Xiu. It was written on the eve of the imperial unification. It was composed in the state of Qin, actually the same state which unified China, and that is why China is named China, the state of Qin. Uh, just 20 years before the imperial unification, uh, they gathered a, a large think tank of uh, intellectuals who wrote a compendium trying to explain how to govern the future unified realm. And look at this. She are those men who, when acting in accord with proper patterns, don't escape the difficulties. Uh, they cast, cast aside life to, fo to follow righteousness. If there are such men, the ruler of a state will not be able to befriend them. The son of heaven will not be able to make them servants. At best, stabilization of all under heaven or second to its stabilization of a single state must come from this man. And then, of course, a worthy sovereign works hard looking for proper men and the rest maintaining affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, come on. This is the most brazen PR campaign from the third century BC. Look, they don't define why we are so nice. As I say, she are those men. We, she are is a common de uh, denomination of all this intellectual stratum. So we are all so good that you just need to work hard to employ us and, you know, work hard to employ us, pay us good salaries. Sorry. This was very, very clear that if you want to show how much do you respect them, pay them. So pay us and then 
employ us and then don't do anything. We shall run the state in your name. Now you see, this type of discourse is intolerable, uh, not only for the far thinkers, even some of the Confucians who were very much on the intellectual part of this equation, they felt that this discourse is not good. So we have Xunzi. Uh, Xunzi is uh, perhaps the greatest thinker of the Warring States period, uh, surely philosophically the most sophisticated and uh, politically the most sophisticated thinker. And uh, Xunzi, he feels it doesn't go in the, in the right direction. So he still very much defends the autonomy and the pride of the Shi, but he dismisses entirely the idea of ruler minister's friendship. He dismisses entirely all this haughty discourse which uh, characterizes Mengzi and his like. And, and, and now we come finally to the point of suppressing intellectuals. Xunzi believes that some ideas are not good and the ideas which are not good should not be allowed to be promulgated. So if there is a good ruler or a good, very good minister, then those thinkers with, with whom Xunzi disagrees, Shen Dao and Mozi, will not be able to advance their talks. And Hui Shen Dengxi will not dare to smuggle in their investigations. Mm. Look, we move now closer to the position of intellectual suppression. Closer, which still we are not inside this, this position of intellectual suppression. We still have a way to go because Xunzi is very careful. Yes, ideally, ideally, when there is a sage monarch, the monarch who is intellectually and not just politically superior to everybody, yes, he is allowed to prohibit vile, vile, vile uh, undertakings, vile argumentations, and vile, vile understandings. But the sage monarchs had passed away. All under heaven is in turmoil and vile speeches arising. Okay. A nobleman, a nobleman is, uh, of course, the most desirable position of an intellectual, like Xunze, Junze, it is not named in Chinese. I have neither pos positional power nor punitive means, so I can only use argumentative persuasions to confront these bad guys, which means we still shall not suppress them. We shall debate against them, we shall explain how bad they are, but I am not in the position to suppress them. When there will be the real sage monarch, then, okay, these people can be suppressed. Now, Xunze was very careful because he did not believe that sage monarchs are very often coming to this world. So he could say, when there will be the sage monarch, we shall see. But there were guys who were much more blatant and we are now turning finally to the heroes of my presentation, to Lord Shang and Han Fei. Lord Shang, the Qin reformer of the fourth century BCE, he penned the book named Shang Jin Shu or the book of Lord Shang. Han Fei lived a century later. Uh, both of them are usually defined as a far thinkers or legalists or so-called legalists. So they have something that, things in common, but actually a lot of separate emphases. What they have in common that they believe she are useless. And why they are useless? Because we are in the warring states world. And we go to, when we go to war, sorry, professors of humanities are useless. When we go to war, we need fighters and we need tillers to, to work at home and to provide, to have enough grain to, to feed the armies and the armies to conquer more territories and to have more subjects to uh, feed more armies. And then finally, we shall unify all under heaven, which will indeed happen, which was Shang Yang's idea. So she, they don't belong to this. They're useless. Second, if we allow them to advance, then there is no possibility to reward adequately those who really benefit the state. And as you understand, those who benefit the state really, according to Shang Yang, it is not my idea, his idea, that those who benefit the state really are 
tillers and soldiers, and there is no place to advance intellectuals. Moreover, these intellectuals are by default unruly because they move from one place to another. They don't have a clear place to, to which they belong. They can defy any ruler, and this is very dangerous. So let us just suppress them. And I shall start with uh, Lord Shang, and then with, I shall go to Han Fei. You shall see Han Fei is much deeper in analyzing the discourse of the intellectuals. Lord Shang did not understand very much the dangers of subversive discourse. Han Fei was very like modern uh, censorship. He knew very well who is subversive of the state order, but we shall start with Shang Yang and then go to Han Fei. And we shall start with the citation which everybody hates. This is what the Lord Shang says. The six parasites, rites and music, poems and documents, the canonical texts, self-cultivation and goodness, filial piety and fraternal duties, sincerity and trustworthiness, integrity and uprightness, etc., etc., etc. This is called the, uh, the six parasites overcoming the government. When, there is, when that will take root, the state will surely be dismembered. Now, this is really frightening. Okay, we can live without rights and music. You know, it is a court music. We can live without it. We can live without books of poems and documents. But why attack self-cultivation and goodness? Why attack filial piety and fraternal duties? Why attack sincerity and trustworthiness? Nobody ever attacked these ideas. In Chinese history, except drawing a little bit, it is important to, re to recall a very controversial, another controversial thinker from a very different political part of the spectrum, but we shall not discuss Zhuangzi now. Why Shang Yang attacks them? He knew, of course, that he alienated everybody. Just as today, back then, 23 centuries ago, when you say these things, everybody feels alienated. But why he says it? Because his rhetoric is not against morality as such. His rhetoric is against moralizing discourse. People later did not understand well, and that is why they hated him. Su Dongpo, Su Shi, one of the greatest Chinese intellectuals in the entire history of China, of China, he said once the scholars are ashamed to speak about Chang Yang, you know, which is very true today. I shall tell it by the end of my presentation. But Chang Yang attacks this discourse because those who speak, not those who really are filial and fraternal. This is not the problem. Those who, those who speak about filiality and fraternity, benevolence and righteousness, they usually do it in order to promote themselves at the expense of tillers and soldiers. And Shang Yang believed that only tillers and soldiers matter. And he created a new, very peculiar political system in which all the society was divided into 20 ranks of merit, and these ranks of merit were granted on a, through the very objective, quantifiable criteria. You will not like this criteria because uh, the easiest way to gain rank of merit was to kill the enemy at the battlefield, to cut the head of the armored soldier from the enemy, and you are granted one rank. It is per capita advancement, per capita social advancement, if you like. Now, uh, meritorious tillers were also rewarded, but the system was fair, transparent, and it should be exclusive, which means you are not allowed to promote people who don't cut enemies' heads. And uh, what happens? We, the intellectuals, usually do not cut enemies' heads very much, luckily for us. So we are not allowed to go up social, economic, and political ladder, which of course we want. So Shang Yang says this, this is a great statement. Hence it is said, when 1,000 people are engaged in agriculture and warfare, and there is a single man among them engaged in poems, documents, argumentativeness, and cleverness, 1,000 people will all become remiss in agriculture and warfare. You know, I believe that the entire corpus of early Chinese political thought and maybe entire corpus of human political thought, nobody said so 
nice things about the impact of the intellectuals. Just one professor of humanities can destroy the entire warring country. 1,000 people are engaging in agriculture and warfare, and then you have one professor of humanities and everything will be destroyed immediately. Mm, nice. He really respected us. But of course, he considered these intellectuals as, a, as caterpillars who eat society from, from within and who are dangerous politically. Because if the, if learning becomes habitual, the people turn their backs on farming. So even the people follow talkers and persuaders, speak grand words and engage in false debates, they turn back on farming and travel to get food, trying to exceed each other in words. And then they abandon their superiors and those who don't behave as subjects become more and more numerous. This is the teaching that impoverishes the state and weakens the army. Now, you see, uh, we cannot deny that uh, there is some rationale behind his ideas. If you really want every people, everybody in your state to become a soldier, B, tiller, in his free time, he will till the land and when he goes to the army, he will cut enemies' heads, then uh, why, why, why support intellectuals? Uh, and this is the reason of the very harsh anti-intellectualism of Shang Yang. But Shang Yang did not go far enough because he was much less interested in or much less aware of or much less sophisticated to pay attention to the discourse of the intellectuals. He did not very much pay attention to how they construct the system in which they are superior to everybody else. And this, now we go to Han Fei, who is the real heir of Shang Yang and develops his ideas and adds new dimensions to his to, to these ideas. Han Fei believed very much, like Shang Yang, that intellectuals are useless. You see, when the state is at peace, it fosters Confucians and the bra bravos. When the troubles come, it uses armored she soldiers. She is also meaning a soldier. It is very nice playing with the different semantic meanings of the same term. So those whom the state benefits are not those whom it uses. Those whom it uses are not those whom it benefits. We have seen it already in Shang Yang. No need to waste your time. Look at the second citation. It is very interesting. Nowadays, all people within the border the borders discourse on orderly rule and families possess the laws of Shang Yang and Guangzhou. Shang Yang is the same Shang Yang. Guangzhou is another model personality for Han Fei. What is called their laws are actually not the laws, but their ideas, their ideals. These are ideals which Han Fei Zi himself shared very much. But he thinks that if the people engaged in, are engaged in learning, the ideas of Shang Yang and Guangzhou, the state is still getting poorer and poorer because those who discourse on killing the fields are many, yet those who handle the plow are few. If you want to say who is the greatest anti-intellectual, it is Han Fei. He says, even my own ideas, even the ideas in which I believe are useless. We don't need ideas. We need tillers and soldiers. And we don't need intellectuals. We don't need people like myself because Shang Yang is one of the very few intellectuals whom Han Fei really admired. But still, we don't need his views. We don't need his ideas. That is why actually for those of you who think that the so-called legalism is totalitarian, no, it is not totalitarian because it does not have this ideocratic idea. You don't have brainwashing, ah, repeat our ideas, no. You don't need any ideas. The state will not impose ideology. The state just imposes rules of the game and then go to fight the war, till the soil and live your life. We don't need you to believe in our ideas. We just don't believe in the ideas which are detrimental to us. It is a negative suppression, but not positive brainwashing. Now, if Han Fei is so critical of the ideas of the people whom he normally respects, then think how he treats the people whom he doesn't respect, the scholars, students of the text, Confucians, Moist, and so, and so forth and so forth. Now, these are, they epitomize uselessness. First, because they are attached to the irrelevant past and they don't understand the present. 
second, because all their sophisticated words, even the most intelligent find hard to understand. You know, all this philosophy, who needs philosophy? We need something practical. C, the moralizers, those who bring morality into politics, they speak about abstract moral values. And as we know, well into our days, people disagree very violently, I would say, what are what is real democracy? What are real human rights? What are real, what is real so socialism when socialism was popular, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What is real patriotism? It is very difficult to come to terms with these abstract terms and Hanfei says, you just cannot establish simultaneously this motley and contradictory teaching and attain orderly rule. Dismiss them. We don't need these intellectuals who are engaged in useless debates about things which are not practical. And to add another dimension to their detrimental impact, their morality is usually a private morality, which is good for one individual or for one family or for one social group, but not for the state. Because a filial son, you know, why should a filial son go to the battle to fight against the state of Chu or against the state of Wei? to die at the battlefield and let his father die at home of hunger. A filial son just should abandon the army and go back to feed his father, which is maybe a good idea. <laughs> don't, don't say that it is a bad idea, but from the point of view of the state, it is a very bad idea. So we need to dismiss this discourse. This is point number one of Hanfei. Point number one, number two, Han Feitze understands that those who speak about worthiness, about noble men, about all these lofty ideal personalities, they are actually manipulators. They adore themselves. They are selfish. They promote their selfish interests because they want not to work, but be, but be promoted. So they create the fake ideology, which says, ah, a moral person in the government is the must. And of course, we are moral, so please employ us. We have seen already this self-promotion. Han Feidze mercilessly exposes the manipulativeness of this discourse. So he speaks, ordinary men, look, he uses the term in Chinese, pifu, which is a very pejorative term, not a kind of the term which you use usually to intellectuals. And he deliberately abuses this term. They have their private interest, but the sovereign is concerned with common benefit. Not to work, but have enough to sustain one, oneself. Not to serve, but have one's, names, one's name illustrious. These are private interest. Stopping textual studies and publishing the laws and standards, blocking private interest and focusing merits and toils on agriculture and warfare. This is the common benefit. So sorry, the fake noblemen, and Han it time and again, he, he shows how all these definitions, which Confucians and Moist and all the moralizers promote, how all these definitions serve their selfish interest because they define those who contradict the ruler as a moral man. No, we need those who obey the ruler. They are the moral men according to Han Fei. Abandon this discourse. And when this discourse proliferates, it endangers the entire social political system. And you can see it here very clearly. The sages and knowledgeable, the pseudos, the fake sages and the fake knowledgeable, as, as Canfei explains else, elsewhere, they multiply. They produce speeches and create statements in order to attack the standards being implemented from above. Now, when the superior, instead of prohibiting and blocking them, follows and respects them, that is to teach the underlings neither to hit the superior nor to follow the standards. And of course, the entire system will be destroyed. The superior will not be able to overcome his underlings. This is Han Fei's warning. If you follow these guys, if you go with them, it is a disaster. Don't do it. Just never. And then he exposes yet another layer of this subversion behind the lofty discourse of, uh, of the self-respecting intellectuals. 
And this is a political subversion. Uh, I don't know how much time do I have, uh, but uh, I, maybe I shall do it very briefly. Uh, this is a great chapter, which really, if you want to read Hanfeitz and soon the new translation by Christoph Habsmeyer will be published, so you will be able to read it in a new, a very nice translation. This is one of the most interesting chapters because Hanfeitz, uh, it is based on Hanfeitz's memorial to the ruler, and it uses all the moralizers' discourse to say how their ideas are contradictory of their own discourse. You know, the moralizers adored the great leaders of the past, King Zwen and Wu, who, uh, King, King, King Stang and King Zwen, King, King Wu, who overthrew the tyrants and the legendary theorks Yao and Shun, who yielded power to others, not to their sons, but to their meritorious ministers. And Han Fei says, hmm, everybody affirms the way of Yao and Shun and models himself accordingly, hence some murder their rulers and some behave hypocritically toward their fathers. Yao and Shun, King Stang and Wu, each of them oppose the propriety of ruler and minister wreaking havoc in the teachings for future generations. Of course, because all these guys who used the examples of the legendary or semi-legendary rulers from the past, who subverted the idea of hereditary power transfer, they very really wanted to discontinue the idiotic system of dynastic rule. Because in China, in the warring states period, all the ministers were selected because of their abilities. Only the ruler was appointed just because he was the son of the previous ruler. So many intellectuals really wanted to, to destroy it. They could not openly promulgate the end of this system. So they spoke about the great paragon rulers of the past who did not transfer power to their sons. Mm. Han Fei says, no, this is subversion. And he says, uh, it is a very long chapter, which I will not discuss now. I will go just to one of its bottom lines. Now, if a son always praises other people's parents, saying such a such a son's parent get to sleep late and get up early with all their might, they produce wealth in order to keep their offspring, their male and female servants, that would be to malign his own parents. If a minister always praises the bountiful virtue of the former kings, turning its hopes toward it, that is to malign his ruler. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I am now giving the lecture from Beijing. And you know that there are many people in China who are not very happy about current president for good and for bad, Mr. Xi Jinping. And one of the easiest way to criticize him is to lavishly praise Deng Xiaoping, the great leader who ruled China in the eighties. So the more you praise Deng Xiaoping, it is very clear to everybody that the more you praise them, the more you want to criticize current state of affairs. And you cannot outlaw it because Deng Xiaoping is both much respected even in today's China, very much respected. So what can you do? Han Fei is a clever guy who shows, yes, people who praise the previous rulers, you know, I don't know whether vice president is still listening, but if some of you in your university lavishly praise the former prime vice president, it says, he was so great it usually implies some criticism of the current vice president. And uh, we know it, it happens. It happened in China. We just are not happy that somebody exposes mercilessly this hidden message and Han Fei exposes it mercilessly. And he goes to the conclusions. Thus, one subject should not praise the worthiness of Yao and Shun, should not extol the punitive expeditions of Tang and Wu, should not talk of the loftiness of Zillow's men of service. Only he who dedicates all his force to safeguard the standards and focuses wholeheartedly on serving the sovereign, he is the loyal minister. Sorry, no promulgation of the worthiness of the former leaders. No discourse through which you can criticize the current rulers, just serve the ruler. And Han Fei goes one step further and he says, accordingly in the country of a clear sighted sovereign, there are no texts written in books and on bamboo strips, but the law is the, the teaching. There are no discourses of the former monarchs, but officials are the teachers. 
There is no private wielding of swords, but beheading enemy is the valor. Ladies and gentlemen, no text written in books and on bamboo strips. We just don't need any private learning. We need to nationalize. Yes, the law is the teaching, and the official are the the official is the teacher. We don't need all these private intellectuals. We don't need all these ideas which are outside the system of the state control. Han Fei was killed by the guy who was his intellectual ally and political rival, Li Si. Li Si was more successful. He became the prime minister of the unifying Qin dynasty. And 20 years after the death of Han Fei, he launched the most famous event in Chinese history, the biblioclasm, the book burning, which you can see now, it is a, the depiction, of course, from the 16th century, so it has nothing to do with reality of the facts, but uh, it shows the books are burned and the Confucians are buried alive, which is a later uh, legend. It did not happen, but the suppression did happen. Now, this suppression gained the far thinkers, the enmity of the intellectuals for the next 23 centuries, well into our days. Because indeed, these intellectuals who incited the rulers against the intellectuals succeeded. And the intellectuals were suppressed, although, as everybody knows, I think uh, the state of Qi, the Qin dynasty fell just a few years after the biblioclasm and then the Han dynasty restored a semblance of respect to, toward intellectuals. But I will not go into history. I don't I want to go into conclusions and then start the Q&A. Let us summarize first the advantages and disadvantages of this far thinkers anti-intellectual stance. And I want, first of all, to speak about advantages because there are some logical ideas in their criticism. Yes, if you are living in the warring states and you want all your people to engage in war, which I hope very much nobody of us will go back to live in the warring states. But now, for those of you who don't know, I am of Ukrainian origin and live in Israel normally. I'm now living in China, luckily for myself. But uh, so I'm in two countries which are now in the situation of the warring states. Not pleasant. So yes, you can understand that soldiers are more important than professors of humanities. Uh, on the other hand, I should remind those who want to abolish humanities uh, under war that still intellectuals somehow contribute to what is called soft power or what intellectuals invented as a soft power, but maybe it is still real. Uh, you need some soft power, not just hard power to fight wars. Okay, we can discuss it at QAA. Second, the far thinkers were very correct in their identification of the moralizing discourse as subversive. And they were very correct in identification of this moralizing discourse as self-serving for the fake noblemen, for this, those who said, ah, I am so great, I am so clever. We saw it in the Liu Xiu. But should we abolish moralizing discourse altogether? You know, it is very true that many moralizers are hypocrites. But maybe fake moralizers, maybe hypocrites are some a little bit better than blatantly moral leaders. You know, again, I'm a citizen of Israel, so Israel was ruled for many years by hypocrites who were suppressing Palestinians, but at least speaking about peace. And now half of the government are the people who openly promulgate uh, genocide, actually ethnic cleansing of, of Gaza. So I still prefer a little bit hypocrites. A little bit. Uh, finally, yes, it is very clear that there was subversion of the ruler's power in the intellectual discourse. Hanfei did not invent it, it was there. But when you prohibit it totally, you suffocate the legitimate criticism. And Hanfei himself was critical of many rulers. Shang Yang also was critical of current rulers. So if you suffocate everybody, the results were, will be much worse than allowing subvers subversive discourse to prosper. So you see, you can understand their attack, but uh, the weakness of their position is also very clear. So I don't want to just, just 
dismiss them as senseless idiots. They were not. They were very clever, but eager to suppress the subversion they created another set of problems which uh, the later generations had to overcome. And now the question, why? Why did they attack intellectuals? They surely knew that they are not, neither Shang Yang nor Han Fei were chillers or soldiers. They were pure intellectuals who rose through their discourse, not through their practical achievements. So a cynical way to explain will be, okay, I ingratiate myself with the ruler. I say, you see, ah, these intellectuals are so bad. But if we are cynical, why not submit a secret memorial to the ruler and say, you see, these intellectuals are very bad, but openly you will never say it. These guys spoke openly. They knew their books circulated and they were proud of what they saw, said. So I want to make this lofty interpretation. They wanted to prove how impartial they are, how dedicated they are to the common good. And the impartiality means I don't serve my own class. I don't serve my own stratum. I say what I have to say. And uh, okay. Han Fei says to the ruler, Beware, every minister is a bad plotter. Come on, you are the minister. How do you dare to how dare you say these things to the ruler? But uh, if you say you prove that you are very impartial. Uh, Tao Jiang wrote an excellent book about Chinese philosophy, and he speaks about impartiality as a moral value specific to the far thinkers. Uh, which the moral value of Gong, of being impartial, of being committed to the common goal and not to your private selfish interests. And it is a good point, at, at least open to discussion. But, and here is my final slide, the price. The price is that if you don't want to promulgate intellectual discourse and you don't believe in intellectuals and you don't want to raise your students and you don't want to create a school of thought like Confucians or the followers of Mozi created, then you remain alone. And when you, are, when you are alone, then all your lofty ideals, which can be very good, can succeed only if you have a ruler who is clever enough to accept your ideas, to employ you, to give you free reign. But you know, you will forever be a lone rider surrounded by all the ministers who hate you because you all the time say, ha, you, my friend, you are subversive, you are good for nothing. So sooner or later, they will eliminate you. And it is a cruel, it is a cruel irony of Chinese history that the only thinkers who met violent death in the warring states period were not those who bitterly criticized the rulers, who ridiculed the rulers, neither Mengzi nor Zhuangzi, nor any of those who thinkers who told the rulers that you are idiots and you are mediocrities, but Shang Yang was executed, Han Fei died in custody, Li Si was executed. Only those who were fully committed to the rulers to autocracy met their cruel fate because the rulers are not reliable. You still need some support among the fellow intellectuals and when you betray them, they betray you. And unfortunately, in the long term, uh, it created a bad situation that the ideas of the far thinkers, which aside from what I discussed today, they have a lot of interesting ideas, not maybe very nice, but surely, very interesting. These ideas were somehow sidelined. Everybody knew that they are practically very good, but nobody dared to discuss them openly. And this is, to a certain extent, the situation in academy well into our days. And I think that now, after 23 centuries, we can forgive them for their naughty anti-intellectual discourse and try to evaluate their ideas and their own value without considering them class traitors. But 23 years of oblivion is the great tragedy of far thinkers. 
thank you very much. And now I'm open to the questions. Thank you so much, Yuri. That was a uh, that was a tour de force. Um, speaking as someone who has attempted to read and understand some of the texts that you were talking about tonight, and knowing how complex they are, how difficult some of them are to understand, I'm full of admiration. Um, I would also just like to say that in praising you. I am going to refuse to praise any previous Morrison lecturers because you have now shown me that by saying you, Professor Yuri, compared with last year's Morrison lecturer, the Morrison lecturer from years before you, I refuse to make that comparison because I know that it would, I know what it really means now. So thank you for, for telling me that. 